This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Even though the Russian central bank had spent years and years building up a giant war chest of well diversified reserves, the Russian ruble is in big trouble. I mean, only a month ago, I made a provocative video about this smart Russian monetary strategy, going on and on about how Europe had strong incentives not to go along with American sanctions, given its reliance on Russian gas. And for the first few days of the war, this prediction actually held up pretty well. European nations such as Germany and Italy were hesitant holding back sanctions. Until they didn't. And now not only Europe but also Japan and likely even neutral Switzerland have announced that they will sanction Russia's war chest directly. As a consequence the Russian ruble is collapsing. So did the West outsmart the Russian central bank? And how is Russia going to retaliate? Let's get into it. As it stands, Western sanctions target three groups in particular. The first group are wealthy or well-connected Russians. The second group are banks, potentially also through the SWIFT messaging system. And finally, the third group is the central bank itself. So let's talk about the lightest and most common form of sanctions first. Targeting wealthy individual Russians, especially those connected to the regime. The idea here is that these are the most important supporters of Putin's regime. By hitting them where it hurts, they might turn against the war and therefore pressure Putin to back off. In this case, this could be extra effective since roughly 20% of Russian household wealth is held offshore in nations such as Cyprus, Switzerland and the United Kingdom. But in all honesty, economic historians typically find that such sanctions are not very effective at discouraging invasions such as these. So that brings us to the sanctions that are really putting the ruble under pressure. These will make it more difficult for Russia to fund its war. But more importantly, a lower ruble will hurt Russia by increasing inflation through more expensive imports. And even though Russia's economy is pretty self-sufficient in key sectors such as food and energy, the country still imports a lot of goods such as machines, clothes and cars. So how does sanctioning the second group, Russian banks, hurt the ruble? Well, by not allowing Western banks to do business with them, Russian banks can no longer facilitate international transactions. On top of this, excluding Russian banks from the much-hyped Western messaging system called SWIFT will pretty much achieve the same objective. Sure, both of these could be worked around by Russian banks. For example, they could opt not to use the SWIFT messaging system, but just, you know, old school pick up a phone. Or they could use a similar but less developed messaging system such as the ones developed by China and Russia itself. The same pretty much goes for individual sanctions. Banks could theoretically get around these by working with non-Western banks. However, this is not easy. Just imagine working at a Russian bank right now. You are facing one of the worst disruptions of your business ever and now you are expected to change your biggest systems and client networks all at the same time? Yeah, that's just not going to happen anytime soon. And that is where Russia's central bank was supposed to come in. In my previous video, I discussed how it could use its massive war chest of foreign currency reserves to cushion the blow of these sanctions. Basically, it could stop the fall of the ruble by selling some of its foreign currency denominated reserve assets such as bonds and just buying a lot of rubles with them. And to counter a potential freezing of its assets by the United States, the Russian central bank had made sure to park most of these reserve assets in Europe which depends heavily on Russian gas. Boom, sanction immunity achieved, right? Well, no, the thing in economics is that the participants in it typically act strategically. This means that action by one player might evoke a counter action by another. And this is exactly what happened. I mean, who knows, maybe European leaders had even seen my video. Okay, let me present to you the one thing standing between Russia and Western economic sanctions. In any case, after the war in Ukraine stalled, Europe did commit to sanctions. And together with Japan, the United Kingdom and Switzerland, they assaulted Putin's war chests directly. Which is really quite unprecedented. You see, together these countries are threatening to freeze Russia's euro, dollar, yen and franc denominated reserves that fall under their jurisdictions. And while this all sounds very complicated, in practice it means that when the Russian central bank calls their broker to sell French government bonds or some other instrument, the broker will just say no. Or if they want to access the accounts that they have at the German Bundesbank, the German Bundesbank will just say And with this move the West has basically broken Russia's central bank. And yes, by that they also invalidated the analysis that I made in my previous video. The consequence is that now the sanctions on banks weigh much more heavily. The ruble is plunging hard. There are queues outside of Russian banks. 
Russian inflation is expected to surge and the Kremlin will find it harder to finance its invasion forces. But there are two important points here that might complicate matters. The first is that some of these sanctions might yet turn out to be just smoke and mirrors. And the second point is that Russia might be able to defend its currency even without its war chest. Let's talk about smoke and mirrors first. Sure, all of these sanctions sound extreme and market participants now are already reacting to them as if they were already in place, but it's important to remember that they are not all already in place. Yes, some banks have lost access to SWIFT, but importantly, they are still allowed to use the system for energy transactions. So perhaps some smart Russian banks can get around the ban by just indicating that many of these transactions are now energy transactions. And even if that is not possible, many, many of these transactions actually are energy transactions. You could even argue that they are the most important ones. So yeah, that's a pretty big loophole. And about these central bank reserves, it's not yet clear how much of them will actually be frozen. This means that the Russian central bank might still have some time to move most of them to other jurisdictions. And on top of that, Russia is fighting back against sanctions in some other ways. For example, many now fear that Russia will cut off Europe from its precious gas anytime now. Then again, we must remember that this is also not in Russia's interest because it will leave them with even less money to fund their war and prop up their currency. In other words, the more it cuts off Europe, the more quickly its war chest will deplete. So for now, Russia's central bank is trying to attract foreign money by raising its interest rate from 9.5% to a whopping 20%. On top of that, it has now initiated capital controls to prevent citizens from sending money out of the country. And finally, it has pledged to provide liquidity to all banks in need. So with the West having broken Russia's central banking strategy, the ball is now back in Russia's court. If Russia does cut energy to Europe, the fallout will be bad. Furthermore, Russia is looking at freezing Western assets as well. And finally, as Credit Suisse economist Zoltan Posar has noted, Russia's energy surpluses were funding the West for a large part. So stopping that money flow might lead to tremendous stress in Western financial markets as well. And what about the long-term impact of these massive sanctions on both the use of the dollar as currency and the Russian economy? But first, onto the sponsor of this video, which is Squarespace. Squarespace provides a powerful online platform for which you can create your very own website. For creators, Squarespace really helps you to connect with your audience and generate revenue because it allows you to create gated member-only content. What's more, it allows you to manage your members, send them emails and leverage audience insights all in one easy to use platform. So if that sounds good, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash money macro to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. And finally, if you want to know more about Russia's economy, check out this video over here. And if you want to know more about international finance, check out this video over here. Finally, consider supporting my work via patreon.com slash money macro or by using the Ko-Fi link in the description of this video. Video. 